So welcome to Grand Slam. This is an anatomy of a 261.66% stock option campaign yielding $116,416.74 in just 11 days. So yeah, on this one trade, I made over $1,000. Now, I'm showing you this trade mainly because it has very pristine setups, technical setups, so that you can really see what I'm looking for when I'm searching out there for price impact. This is not a particularly profitable trade. In fact, the, um, I actually made more money in Facebook over that same period of time in Facebook calls. So at the, over the same period of time, I was running uh, uh, Fiat Chrysler calls and Facebook calls. It was really interesting because I have a friend of mine who is a Fortune 500 CEO and has a, he started, he has a background in finance. And so I was over here showing him what I do with options and stuff. And he asked me if anybody in my community purchased these calls at the time when I was buying these, because I run a Monday call for you guys. You guys can decide whether you want to join it or not at the end of the talk. I'm, my main concern here is to educate you guys. And then if you want to join my community, you can. But I actually had at least 15 people that were watching me with this trade. I mean, I told them they weren't watching me do it, put on the actual trade, but they knew the week that I had purchased these calls, that I had purchased these calls. And nobody in my uh, community actually bought the calls. So the main thing that I want you to understand is that if you, it's very, very difficult to make a lot of money in, with anything in the stock market, whether it's calls or just straight shares of stock. If you don't have a lot of conviction, you have to have a huge amount of conviction so that you can not just actually buy the stock, but so that you can hold on to it. So I don't ever want anybody buying stuff just because I buy it. In fact, I tell people in my community that they have to be independent thinkers and I want them out there looking for their own opportunities. However, I don't mind if people actually do piggyback my trades. It doesn't bother me, but it's interesting because very few people actually do it in my community because I teach people in my community how to think for themselves. So for instance, one of our community members actually tested a stock that failed and because of what I'm teaching you now, he actually made 15% return on his, on his test. He was doing it in shares of stock and I'm showing you how to apply this system to options. So some of the mechanics are a little bit different, like in particular, any kind of stop loss width in options is gonna be about four to six times wider or even more um, than it will be when I'm trading the underlying stock. So this is a true story with proof. And I'll never pay a dime of taxes on any of it because this brokerage verified trading tale unfolds within three Roth retirement accounts. I tell people that they need to get their Roth account set up and a lot of people are sluggish and slow in doing it. I started our uh, Roth IRAs back in the 90s. And of course, it's like building a ship in a bottle because you can, can't put very much money in those accounts. Even today with the 50 year plus you know, bump up and how much you can stuff into the account, you can only get $6,500 in there. So between Marisol and I, we're limited to $13,000 per year that we can save into those accounts. Now that's not gonna create very much trading capital to go out there and, and buy underlying stock and buy puts and, and not buy puts, buy calls like I'm teaching you because it's just not a lot of capital. There is another account out there called the Roth Solo K and you really need to get that set up. And it's really interesting because I get people, they wanna get rich in the stock market, but then when I tell them that they need to set up a Roth Solo K because for the same you know, 50 years or older, you can stuff $24,000 into that Roth Solo K account. And the only way you can do it is by setting up a company on your own. You know, Generally the best way to go is an LLC and then run some sort of side business through that company. And I get people and they say, oh, I don't have a side business. And I'm like, whoa, this person is so brain blocked that they can't figure out how to go mow lawns and then turn that into a side business. And I just give up at that point. And there was a really good movie called Joe versus the Volcano by Steven Spielberg. And Tom Hanks in that movie has a brain cloud. And it really, it was the, the deal was, was that he was a hypochondriac and he was completely healthy and didn't have a brain cloud at all. But he lived this really dark, dreary life. It's all black and white at the beginning. And then it's all bright and cheery. And he's living a really fun, full life at the end. And he's not being limited by his fears. And so what I'm showing you today generates an enormous
tremendous amount of fear for anyone because when you're on, when you're riding this rocket ship and you're seeing these returns pile up and pile up and pile up. And, you know, when you're, a lot of people, when they're sitting at $60,000 in this trajectory ended up at $116,416 and 74 cents, but usually at about the 50,000 mark or 60,000 mark, people will get real jittery and they'll shut the position down. So you have to have a lot of conviction and you have to have a very strong direction in terms of where you're going and, and understanding the mechanics of the market. Like for instance, a lot of people will shut down profitable positions um, prematurely. And there's a professor at University of California, Berkeley, Terrence O'Dean, who got a whole bunch of accounts from a very large nationwide brokerage with tens of thousands of accounts. He was able to show that people have a tendency to cut their winners short and ride their losses. And so if you have that tendency, don't do what I'm teaching you to do today. You got to go straighten out your psychology. Now, you know, I don't care if you got to go to a shrink to do it, but you cannot trade the markets the way the average person trades the market to get the kinds of returns I'm showing you here today. So who am I? Am I qualified to guide you? I am Dr. Scott Brown and I hold a PhD in finance from the University of South Carolina. It costs the Darla Moore School of Business over half a million dollars to train me. Only two doctoral students are accepted into that program every two years out of hundreds of serious applicants. No confusion as to why. Newly minted doctorates in finance command the same salaries as medical doctors starting at $350,000 per year on Wall Street. The PhD who graduated the year before my cohort earns over a million a year as head of research for State Street, and he does exactly what I do. He comes through the top finance research journals discovering new ways to make money for State Street shareholders. In fact, what you're about to learn today is some of the most cutting edge research on Wall Street out there. There's a lot of people on Wall Street that don't like the fact that I'm actually teaching you what I'm teaching you today regarding price impact, which is cutting edge. He lives in a mansion in the Hamptons and collects sport cars such as the Maserati pictured later. Vladimir went into Wall Street, but I elected to enter academia with my PhD. I'm a professor of finance at the Graduate School of Business at the University of Puerto Rico on the main campus in Rio Piedras. I publish in top journals in the field as an academic. My research on investing has been featured in the Certified Financial Analyst CFA Institute. I comb top journals just as Vladimir, but I use my insights to enrich my family. I am a family financial steward. Because I make 65,000 per year as a finance professor, I guess you could say my job has literally grown into managing our retirement portfolios. And in fact, just in two days in this last week, I made more money than I made in the entire year or will make in the entire year as a university professor, doing what I'm showing you how to do right now. I had the opportunity to interview one of the three most renowned value investors in the world, pictured here in the middle, Manish Prabhai. The other two most famous value investors in the world are Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. You can listen to the podcast through links for many of my courses. The podcast is Master Your Money, and it's free on iTunes if you want to go out there and search for it now. The man to the right actually happens to be the Secretary of Commerce of the, of the island of Puerto Rico. So you could, I guess, perhaps say I'm well connected. The week after I interviewed Monish, I had lunch with a good friend of mine who's a local CFA. My friend innocently asked me, why is Monish in Fiat Chrysler? All hedge funds have to disclose positions to the SEC, and my friend as a CFA had pulled the composition through Edgar. I don't know, was my response. So when I returned home to my office, this is the chart I saw of Fiat Chrysler, symbol FCAU. I was startled to see an excellent example of price impact. The stock was rising on high volume. The company was posting strong earnings. And it's interesting because if you go out there on the internet, there's a gentleman named W.D. Gann. He ended up retire he ended up dying with so much money from the stock market that he was the most profitable single stock investor to start from nothing from a poor family in the entire last century and if you go out there and you look for clip arts on his doodles i call them doodles because i suspect that um wd gan probably was autistic or something because like you'll see what I mean when you go look at his astrology charts and all this other stuff and you'll see that um, that particular pattern right there that flush in volume right at the end of the chart and then the way that the price is testing that uptrend line 
that was in the way it was crouching down like it was trying to jump up that was a perfect situation to test that particular stock and in addition to that i knew that monish was holding the stock from lower levels in 2012 let me take a sip of green tea here guys monish had hold held this stock from way back in 2012 and so it was trading at around can't see what his trend. I think it was trading around six something or right around six. And Monish had been acquiring that thing at about four. And it ran up really high and then it downtrended for two years. And so I knew that he'd ridden through a whole lot of tough times and he was still holding the thing because, of course, you know, my friend who's a CFA had just confirmed that he was still holding it. I knew he was still dug in like a tick from my lunch with my CFA friend. Let's just say it that way. Now, this was a really strong example of price impact, but it's always vital to remember. So you can see right there where Pabrai was accumulating, where Manish was accumulating, and you can see that he had a real nice run up, and then you can see that really nasty two-year downtrend right just before I was starting to buy it. And um, so, like I said, I knew he had massive amounts of conviction on this stock. So sometimes, you, you know, fundamental analysis is real slippery. Like, the best way to go is just get one just general indicator for earnings, as I'll explain later. I think I explained that in this talk. And a lot of times you're just simply getting confirmation as whether or not the business model really cranks well. And this was just kind of another confirmation that this company had good earnings and was, was strong in its industry and that it was being held by a major hedge fund that focuses on value. So I made a test purchase of 54 calls expiring in March with a seven strike on November 8th. I purchased each call for 90 cents. The test cost was $4 and 80, 480. You know what? I don't think it was a seven strike. I think it was actually a four strike. And the test cost was $4,832 and 16 cents. Well, the thing is, is that. Which slide am I on? Oh yeah, here we go. So that's it. $4,832.16. Now, what I do is once, once I set that test purchase, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like sailing. So like if I get a good, if I get a kind of good breeze, I will go out sailing, put the sail up. If the sail holds and starts to pull the, the ship forward and then get stronger, that's good. That's what we want. So it's kind of the same thing. I put the first test up. It's kind of like, you know, unfurling the first sail. And then um, it held, so I scaled in two other retirement accounts. And believe me, I have a lot of retirement accounts. What am I doing here? There we go. There we go. <laughs> okay, a little bit of little bit of fumbling with the slides there, guys. More purchases two days later for twenty eight thousand nine hundred seventy two dollars and fifty cents at two hundred and sixty five share uh, contracts. And for $10,687.34 of 100 more contracts in the same call, the option was deeper in the money. Now, I paid over $0.30 cents more for these calls than I did on the test. Yeah, I guess I did do seven calls. The test and two scales completed my 2016 campaign on the rise of Fiat Chrysler Automotive, symbol FCAU. The stock rose all the way through February. Now, here's the deal, guys is I like to roll my deep in the money call positions every six months. See, what I do is way different than what other people do with options. I know that the big money is in the long haul. The big money is in the long haul sitting there doing absolutely nothing. In fact, I have this sticker on my computer that says, do nothing. And the reason do nothing is so powerful is because we have all sorts of studies in finance that show that if account turnover goes up, returns go straight down into the toilet. So anybody that's teaching any kind of strategy where you got to do a lot of buying of, of underlying stock, you know, frequent pur purchases and sales of stock or frequent purchases and sales of, of option contracts, you should automatically suspect that that strategy is not going to be a particularly high yielding strategy. Absolutely automatically. We show that result over and over again. And it actually gets harder to make money as your, as your frequency of trading increases. So again, what I do is I like to keep my account turnover down. So I do a roll normally from September to March. And, and I have found that that seems to be the sweet spot for the roll. If you take a look at certain kinds of equity index futures contracts, 
the key liquidity is on the September to March um, expirations. So I have noticed that the September to March roll works out really well to me. A lot of times we get a lot of softness going into the fall after September, and we get a lot of softness going into the summer after March. And then we get a lot of strengthening going, you know, usually going into, you know, the cold months. We have these studies in finance that show that the colder the weather in Manhattan, the more bullish the stock market. The colder the weather in Manhattan, the more bullish the stock market. So when I see people, you know, freezing, jumping out of windows because they're freezing to death, I guess they don't do that, do they? But anyway, when I see people just getting slaughtered with, with freezing cold, I just laugh with glee because I know that the stock market is likely to rise. So when you get into the summer and this, it's hotter then you know, hotter weather in Manhattan has a tendency to soften the returns in the stock market. So September, March roll, you will find has a tendency to work best when you're doing a long-term strategy. Now, what I like to do is find stocks like, for instance, I've been trading Facebook from like a million years ago. So I will, you, you know, and I've, I've made money on Berkshire Hathaway. I've made money on Apple. So usually I'm making money on the big elephants in the room. There's big one name stocks. What slide are we on? Number nine. These big one name stocks. And so this is really unusual in that I've made a lot of money in a, in a, in a, a smaller stock. It's not that small, but that it has more than one name, Fiat Chrysler Automotive. We have other studies in finance that show that one name stocks have a tendency to rise more. Now I sold off 265 calls on February 24th at 371. This generated a $69,939.86 profit and a $237.94 return. Six days later, I sold off 100 more calls for a profit of $30,224.33 and a yield of 282.8%. Then I sold off the final 54 contracts you can see there for $4.10 and a profit of $17,255.55. This is the highest trade return in my career. It's 357.1%. It's just a crazy return. But look, it's on a small amount of money. It's not like it's across you know, a big block of cash. The total campaign return is 261.66%, uh, and the total profit is $116,416.74. So, um, and I'll be answering your questions as soon as I get through these slides. Um, we're, we're, we've only, I've only got 20 slides, and we're like halfway through, and it'll get faster, like I'll show you right now. This is a screenshot of my account statement documenting the initial test. I'm showing you my statement. So this is, the, this is fact, man, fact. Here's the exit documentation. Is that 11? Yeah. Uh, here's one of the scales entry facts. This is the proof of exit of the first scale. Here's the purchase of the second scale of 100 contracts. And then this is the exit documentation. Now, the irony is I actually made more money, like I said, on Facebook calls over the same period, but I was rolling up and out from a large prior position. Because what happened was, was I was in Facebook for an eternity and made a, made just a boatload of money on it, and then um, Apple started to pick up. Now I, I always call Apple crapple because it's it's an old you know stock, and old stocks don't have, tend to do as well. But it picked up, and then the and then the PRC jacked the market, the People's Republic of China. Um, I'm not a particular fan of the PRC. I will make that known, but they jacked the market by um, jerking around their. Uh, currency exchange rate and and i mean i don't i can't understand how those dirt bags got their currency added to the sdr i don't i can't figure out how the international monetary fund accepted that um switzerland did the same thing in the same year and i'm just waiting for their currency to get gobbled up by the euro i do not recommend anybody trading the, the swissy period if you're a currency trader avoid the swissy uh because i believe that thing is going to collapse in, into the euro but anyway enough of that so anyway, nonetheless, I earned over a quarter of a million from the stock market between November of 2016 and March of 2017. But when the, when the PRC jacked the market back in 2015, I got hit pretty hard and um, I was in Apple. And so I rolled that November in 2015 into Facebook. So that particular position is actually a position that's been rolling forward from all the way back in November. So it's been just rolling forever.
and um, it's it's ginormous now because um, since since this has happened in Facebook, that position has expanded another uh, number of hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's 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 much larger now with a profit on the FCAU calls with this one stock option campaign alone, I could buy a quad report for my wife, like my comrade Vladimir did for his in the Hamptons. And of course, that tips you off that he might be from somewhere, you know, Russia like, because I said, comrade. <laughs> Here's a novel idea. I could change my socks. I do change my socks and underwear daily, I promise. Why not cars? With the cash I grabbed from this stock option campaign, I could buy a Fiat 500 for each of the five working days of the week, plus one for the weekend. Each of those would be painted a happy color except for one. The brown card would be for bad market days. Yeah, things do get a little loose when the markets go crazy. Or I could just buy the Quat Report. Hmm, choices. So, you know, now what I want to do is, you know, conclude the, uh, not conclude, but I'm going to step out here. I'm going to answer questions. We're going to look at charts and basically go over anything that I can do. Um, Brian Olson says, nice trade. Is this repeatable? Well, let me see. I've been repeating the, this particular type of trade since 2013. Now, you got to remember is that I don't do them very many of these per year. I might do one, two, three. Three per year would be a lot. You know, normally I'll get a, a really big, massive return on one or two um, stock options or stocks, you know, per year. Uh, I, I'm very, very meticulous in, in which um, particular stocks I'm actually testing. Hey, and Arnis Busevius is here. Arnis is from, um, uh, he's in Germany right now. Um, let me go back because you guys have been asking questions. Let me back up. I don't see the trade. Am I not showing? Okay, you guys can see. Okay, wait. Canada doesn't have Roth or 401ks. Yes, but you have the RRSP. The Registered Retirement Savings Plan, Michael Bryden says, Canada doesn't have Roth or 401ks. And the answer is that you can do this strategy through the RRSP. And I am surprised at how few Canadians understand the power of the RRSP. It has enormous advantages, Michael, and you need to go dig into those advantages up there in Canada. So do this through an RRSP. Now, here's the thing. Um, here's the thing, if you guys are in Europe, you can hold shares of stock for more than six months. At least I know in Belgium you can. And you don't pay any capital gains tax. So in this case, you may have some advantages to holding shares of stock um, versus the options. I'm not sure if you're able to hold options for more than six months and avoid taxes. And again, it's going to be country specific. So we've got one guy here from um, Sweden. We've got another guy here from uh, at least from Germany. So you're definitely going to have to you're definitely going to have to figure out which accounts you can trade to reduce your um, your taxation problems. So um, Stefan Schmidt says, when is it premature and uh, when is it profit taking? So basically, you need to be tracking your stocks um, via the. Um, this is a long term trend following system, so you need to be tracking your stocks. via the trend. So like for instance, when I entered this position, I've got a trend line here of this angle. And so I can pull this trend line back and you'll notice that one of the things you'll notice with this stock in particular with Fiat Chrysler is it happens to have a rather geometric pattern there's a lot of there's a lot of geometric angles in this particular stock. Now, not all stocks have them. I started to notice. Well, WD Gam was really big on geometric angles, and um, I kind of blew it off. But then um, I told you that when the PRC jacked the market with their currency idiocy, and believe me, that was bad. So um, they needed to be bludgeoned. The central bankers of China needed to be bludgeoned to death. I can let me tell you. So anyway. Um, what happened was was that when that market um, fractured and I was watching the VIX 
and the VIX became really, really geometric. Like um, the not just the VIX, but the um, S the E mini S and P futures contract became really, really geometric. So there's a lot of um, geometric tendencies in these markets that we're not normally completely aware of, but we can really see it here in Fiat Chrysler. So right now I've got a loose trend line kind of running here, but obviously if this position tested this area here, I'm out because that because that would basic the market would be would be basically breaking the long term uptrend line. And I'm giving it a lot of latitude because you can see that this is this is a pretty um, low angle uh, trend line. Okay, so that's that's how I, I take profits is I'm paying really close attention to the long term trend line. Brian Olson says, yeesh, isn't Puerto Rico heavily in debt? Oh my gosh, not only is Puerto Rico heavily in debt, I'm getting paid still, knock on wood, but the students went on strike to close the school. So that's why I'm sitting here talking with you today because I've got the time to do it. Michael Bryden says, Aaron indicator, Petrosky nine factor system. I don't know, don't have a clue what that means, Michael. Um, um, how liquid are these calls? The calls have to be very liquid. That's something I pay very, very close attention to. I will go up to, for instance, let's take a look at Fiat Chrysler here. Are we after 9.30 yet? Yeah, we sure are. So the easiest way to do this is just go to Yahoo. If you're looking at a stock and you know, you're not yet quite sure you're gonna test it, the first thing you wanna do when you're looking at any of these stocks is to come in here and take a look at your liquidity. Now, this is always gonna throw you on the, the closest term months. So you've got, again, remember, September, March roll. See, now notice how there's no, there's no intermediate, um, there's no intervening um, expirations between September and de December, that tells you something. So again, like I say, September to March roll. So when we look, for instance, here at Fiat Chrysler, you can see that we've got um, reasonably strong liquidity out here on a September to March roll. And the other thing that you wanna pay close attention to when you glance at these option chains, um, if I'm actually going to, like I said, I test very rarely. So at the point at which I'm actually going to test the option, I'll scrape all of this data here and I'll drop it into a spreadsheet and I'll summate the open interest. So if you wanna summate the open interest. Now, a lot of people will pay close attention to the, um, to the volume ratio, um, the put call volume ratio. So basically they'll take the, the total volume of puts and the total um, volume of calls, calls are up here, puts are down here. And then they'll divide that and they'll come up with this measure of whether or not there's more volume going into puts or calls on that, on that day. That's a, that is not useful, do not do that. We have studies that show that the ratio of put to call open interest is far more powerful. So you wanna you know, scrape this over to a spreadsheet, summate all of these numbers here, the open interest for the calls, and then summate all the open interest for the puts, and then, um, and then divide the put open interest by the call open interest, and you want it to be really low, right? You know, or I guess you could divide calls by puts, that's fine too. You can run your ratios however it's easiest for you to read them, but just remember how you calculate them. Um, Uh, Peter Heidenreich, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Brian Olson, nice trade. Is this I've, repeatable? I answered that. What Swiss clapped in the euro? Did I hear that right? Yeah, Michael. The Swiss is a piece of junk now after they jacked their currency. You see, if you study the history of the currency markets, this is not a currency market call. You will find that um, the Bretton Woods system was was dis disintegrated into a free floating convenium, and so the most powerful currencies are free floating. The Swiss um, did a, uh, did a, a, a allowed their central bankers to divvy out the to fudge their currency values in 2015, as did the Chinese. Thus, those two currencies are garbage, garbage currencies. And I sound like Trump now. I got to get my Trump voice on. But um, but yeah, garbage. Uh, Luke Wang says, "Will we get a recording of this session?" Yes, you will. Um, I'm a big fan of the Guomindang. I believe that Chiang Kai-shek was the correct leader for China, not Mao. And so I am definitely anti-PRC, but they can't reach out and touch me here in Puerto Rico, so I can say that. Peter uh, Warch says, in Germany, you can hold options as long as the options run. Okay, Peter, yes, but 
the difference is 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 um, what taxation rate will you pay? Will you pay um, like for instance, I've got a student in Belgium and he uh, is starting in stocks, so I taught him how to create a diversified ten stock portfolio uh, based on the uh, the German DAX, and um, and I showed him that the 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 highest liquidity in Europe is between the German DAX and the French um, CAC and um, how to then create a 10 stock portfolio kind of split between the DAC and the CAC. And in that process, I discovered that Belgium citizens, if they hold the stock for more than six months, they don't pay any taxes on it. It's not the problem of holding the option. The problem is, is well, do you, how do you get taxed on the returns? In the case of the accounts that I just talked about earlier, in the case of the Roth accounts, um, I never pay taxes again. In the case of the solo K accounts, then um, those will pay taxes at the long term at our long term rates when we're in retirement. Um, so that was the that was my inference. Scott Allen says, "I hear that could happen this year at a much larger scale, uh, main ten percent decal." Any thoughts? Scott, what do you mean by that? Um, do you mean, do you, um, I'm trying to understand what you mean. What could happen? What comment did I make that sparked that particular question? Um, Brian Olson says, I don't, dispute, I don't dispute what you're saying, but my only concern at this point is that by many metrics, this bull run is a little long in the tooth and I'd hesitate um, to get um, long calls and I'll assume that you're using leaps. I'd be interested to hear how successful your system um, was per 2000, uh, pre 2008. I wasn't doing it before 2008 and I was starting to work it up, but I would have, I'd have the same returns. Um, I'll assume you're utilizing same data collected. I apologize for longer message. No. Hey, Brian, you're just gonna have to do it. I'm not selling you on this thing. I'm telling you that the highest expected returns are in stocks of more and more higher expected returns in futures, higher expected returns than Forex. If you look in the stock market, the highest expected returns are in momentum stocks. Momentum stocks are rising into new highs. That's it. That's the definition of momentum, Brian. It doesn't have anything to do with earnings. It doesn't have anything to do with jack all out there. It's just the stock went into newer highs, okay? That's where the highest expected returns are. If a person leverages, gears those returns up, those, now those momentum returns can be as high, expected momentum returns as 18 to 20% annual average, depending on how many you know, decades you're looking back, right? That's a lot. If you take an option that has you know, three, four, five times gearing, you're gonna multiply an 18% return times three, four, or five. So that's why when you take a look at the highest returning hedge fund out there that I've ever heard of, uh, which is Cornwall Capital, because they made so much money on the big short on the CDOs, they run at about 50% per year, right? So that I consider to be kind of the higher threshold and how much money a total portfolio can make per year, about 50% with a leverage strategy. So I'm telling you, this is where the highest returns are from academic research and from Wall Street. Now, whether or not you want to go and do what you say, if you want to go back, and take this strategy and back it all up and pull the returns out from before 2008, that's fine. And, you know, like I say, if you, you know, if, if you like or don't like this strategy, that's fine. I'm not here to sell it to you. I'm here to educate you. And I'm trying to teach you that the highest returns are in the deep in the money call. They're not in the put. They're not in the, they're, they're in the long call. They're not in the, they're not in the, as, as high in the long put, they're there. And then those are the only two positive expected returns of any type of option trade out there. And I've got people I know just screaming, oh, that's not true. I can make millions and bazillions selling puts. I can make billions and zillions selling calls, just covered calls. And then I can protect that covered call position even further with a long put. Then what you're doing is you're creating, um, which you're, you're creating um, hedges, spreads, we call them in futures. And when you go back and you look at the histories, you won't see any multimillionaires made on spreads, or at least not made on spreads alone. Um, Luke Wayne says, very nice trade on FCAU. We are inspired. Well, you can do it. You just have to basically train your uh, visual cortex, as I will explain in a second how to do that. Uh, Stefan Schmidt says, but the Swiss is doing better than the euro. 
I believe that that's temporary, Stefan. And the reason is, is because um, the euro is facing a whole bunch of um, external threats, mainly from the knuckle dragon um, half of the English class that uh, voted pro Brexit. So I don't believe that England is going to pull out of the eurozone. I could be totally wrong, but they still haven't enacted um, uh, paragraph 150 um, or section 150. So um, that's uh, there's a lot of stuff like that that's holding the euro down. But you already the reason that the Swiss central bankers devaluated that currency is because the strength of the Swiss currency was was creating enormous distortions across that border. And so uh, when they devalue the currency, another problem that that creates is it creates a reticence with other countries in terms of their willingness to trade through that currency. So if you take a look at the total uh, amount of currency volume that's trading across all your currencies, you'll see that Swissy is uh, a lot lower than, you know, the Aussie or the, or, or the, uh, or the Kiwi or any of that other stuff, just because again, you know, you don't inspire confidence in trade when you jack your currency rate around, you know, ditto for the, uh, for the PRC. There's most of the transactions, export import transactions running through China are being run directly through the Euro or the US dollar or the Japanese yen. And the reason is, is because people just don't trust the, uh, the Yuan. They don't want a lot of money built up in an unstable currency with central bankers with itchy triggers that might jack that rate around. Roger uh, Aaron says, Dr. Brown, is there uh, any uh, evidence to support using trailing stop losses based on stock prices to uh, is superior to trailing stop losses based on option prices? We ran trailing stops when we did um, a study on newsletter returns. Um, okay, where is that? Do you that's a really good class question, and and I'll answer it. Do newsletters move? Yeah, here, do investment newsletters move the market? CFA pubs. Okay, good. So we published a study in a very prestigious academic journal in finance, and we showed that um, one of the Oxford Club newsletters moves the market around a lot. And um, you can go read the the. Cliff Notes version from um, Claire Emery. She's a CFA at uh, the at uh, the CFA Digest um, for the Certified Financial Analyst Institute. And um, one of the things that we don't report in this study is that uh, the newsletter that we were following actually recommended um, stop losses, Roger. And when uh, Eric, who has a PhD from MIT in finance, um, programmed the stop losses, the the trail. Um, it had no impact on the returns. And that freaked me out. So what that told me was that trailing stop losses are worthless. So what I do is if you take a look, for instance, let's look at a let's um I'm talking about Fiat Chrysler, kind of the whole thing, but let's kind of step away from Fiat Chrysler and take a look at Facebook that's been pushing up to higher highs. Now I don't know. This thing is it's this thing is about due to kind of set in a consolidation zone or reverse or whatever. So I'm watching it to determine whether or not I need to take a profit or whether or not it's going to continue to run. And, um, you know, so I have to watch it very carefully. But um, if let's say that you decided to test um, Facebook because it's showing momentum. Remember, the definition of momentum is the stock is rising in a new highs. We're in a bull market because the S&P 500 is rising in the new highs and the, and the, and the Dow is rising in the new highs. Now I'm going to ask a question as I explain this, and I want you guys to type in your answers, but how long on average does a bull market last? How long on average does a bull market last? Okay. So let's say I was going to buy Facebook is trading at 152.80. Um, I would just simply, I should try and let me say I can pull up my calculator. Should have thought to pull up my calculator. If you take a look, there's a really important book that everybody should read on this call, and it's How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market by Nicholas Darvis. In fact, this entire um, system is very similar to his, except for the fact that I'm not trading rights. He was able to buy rights that gave him the same leverage I'm getting from, from um, calls, from long calls. 
And he had a system that allowed him to, his system did the same thing. It was capturing momentum and price impact. He would look at volume and, um, you know, and uh, the relationship between volume and the slope. So let's say I was able to get in at um, 152.86. I said, you know what? I believe that Facebook is going to continue to rise. I'm going to start building a campaign on it. You know, um, Apple was up at like 700, I think, before they, they, they split it up. Um, Google is trading. What's Google trading at right now? Where's Goog, the Goog monster? Goog monster is trading at almost just shy of a thousand dollars. And I'm like, Hey, you know, I don't see how the Goog monster is any stronger than, than, um, Facebook. You know, why in the heck, why in the heck shouldn't Facebook be at a thousand dollars someday? So I'm like, you know, Jethro, I'm going to go out there and buy me some of them shares. So all we got to do to set a stop is real simple. We multiply by 0.95. I looked at all the stops that Darvis ran and his sweet spot was somewhere around 5%. And I have found that if I can't get a stock to run, that didn't work for me very well at all. I'm really looking like a hillbilly here. Uh, 152.77, 152.77. And then just multiply that by 0.95 and that'll give you a nine, a uh, 5% stop. What am I doing? What's my calculator doing? 0.95 times 153. I, I got something weird going on here. It's not, and my calculator is not calculating properly. But anyway, the main thing is, is that if we pull five, let me see, 5% is going to be about five bucks back, a little bit more. God, why isn't it doing it? Here's my lotto logbook. I run a lotto system. I can get this stupid thing to work. I can't get my calculator to work. 152. I have a lotto system where a lot of people pick certain numbers, so I pick numbers other people don't pick and then just run a ticket. It's kind of like an investment. Think of it that way. Equals. I wasn't supposed to show you that, but the stupid Microsoft calculator, what a junkie stock, didn't work. Oh, it was doing it. I'm just a little drowsy this morning. <laughs> Okay, we have to laugh at ourselves from time to time. Uh, 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 ego is not a good thing when you're trading stocks. An absence of ego, being like Spock. Okay, so 145. So 145.198. God, I can't breathe it. That, my friends, is a 5% stop. That means if you put $1,000 in that stock, the maximum you're going to lose is $50. I mean, it's not a hard bet to see that that's a good bet, right? Now, to go and plop, you know, a call down that's going to cost you $1,200, see, with a call, when I'm on a call, I'll put a 50% doomsday stop in. And the reason for that is, is if the world melts down, I've got something there to catch it. and you have to have a really wide active difference between the activation price and the actual stop price when you're doing these positions. This is really, really important. George Ma says, how about using your strategy for long period of options, like more than a year? I've been doing this since 2013. As a, as a knuckle dragger, I have to tell you the UK will leave the EU, it says John Webster. John, I owe you a beer if you will drink it with me in London. <laughs> the Brits, I mean, they did, they did invoke the article, Article 50 on March 29. Did they invoke it? Yeah, I, um, I have a tendency to ignore uh, world politics. So <laughs> Brian says, thanks for responding. I trade options myself and can appreciate the leverage, leveraging power of them. As you can imagine, we retail traders are inundated with, with uh, people touting systems with relatively short histories. Based on the chart you shared, this system could be utilized on any liquid stock coming out of a base. 
I appreciate your candor. Thank you, Brian. I mean, I just completely offended poor old John over there in London. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally owe him, you know, uh, a beer and chips, bitters. Because, um, uh, you know, I, well, anyway. Brad G says it has earnings tonight. Um, how do I find um, today's time uh, schedule? Okay, 9.25 years. Okay, okay, great. So you guys are answering my question. How long does a bull market last, by the way? By the way, hey, John, just to be fair, anybody in finance was against the against Brexit. I mean, you'd look at the voting records and everybody in London was you know, was for it because they were all depended on the financial system. So it was, it was a real bad thing for the British financial system. And then we're just gonna have to wait and see whether or not it's gonna be a good or bad thing for actual goods exports. I'm just sitting here talking with you just like we were sitting in a pub. Because you know, everybody loves to talk politics this way. And I'm just a loudmouth yank anyway. And I'm not very informed because I didn't even know that you'd actually invoked Article 50. And I called it Article 150, which shows you how completely off the mark I was throughout the entire conversation, laughing out loud. I guess I can just laugh out loud. But anyway, it turns out that I'm actually, I do know this statistic, I'm not incorrect on this statistic, I can show you the textbook, but it turns out that the average length of a bull market, you guys, is 18 years, 18 years. Now let's go and sit here and figure out how long this bull market's been going. And if we look at the spider, which is the S&P 500, you can see that if we, we could go all the way back to 2008, and we'd be just right at about, what, nine years, maybe 10 years into this bull market. Um, if we go all the way back to 2000, you know, maybe then we could say we're at the average. That's the average length of a bull market. There's some bull markets that go on longer than 18 years. And this thing looks like it's a, this looks to me like a formation that's trying to extend upward, not downward. This looks all bullish to it. So why is it that people, and by the way, I want to thank, um, it was our friend from Canada who made the comment that he felt that, I think it, that he felt that the bull market didn't have any more legs. The reality is, is that um, I wouldn't be surprised if this bull market continued another 10 years. I mean, another 10 years. And by the way, I wonder what's gonna happen with Scotland, because I know Scotland doesn't want it out. Uh, Reg says, back in the good old days, I think it was four up and two down, give or take. Uh, this one is out of bounds. Um, yeah, like I say, if we get a really strong hot bull market, if we get the bull market of the century, then um, all the people that are expecting mean reversion are going to be wrong. See, there's, there's, a, there's something that psychologists know, there's something that economists know, there's something that financial economists know, and that is that, that um, people have a tendency to expect mean reversion. The problem is, is that the distribution of this particular price pattern or price series is not a bell curve. It's not a bell curve. The returns are log normal, log normally distributed. That means, then that exists because a stock can go from $100 to zero, um, so it can only drop 100%, but it can go up by two or three times that, two or three times that. And um, Brian says, I just pulled Darvis back off my shelf. I bought it some uh, time back and haven't gotten around to reading it. I'll check it out now. Um, a, a good, Brian, that's an important thing to do. Uh, Reg said that should be 135 or so. Yeah, I, I was just, like I said, uh, Elaine did it for me. Elaine's in my community. Elaine says a 146.08 stop. Um, everybody in my community knows how to calculate those 5% stops. Brian Olson says, I may be more interested in your lottery system instead. Well, reach out and I will get you a copy of that. I think I'm going to publish it actually as a free course. Uh, Michael, <laughs> Brian, and thank you for that, Brian. I think that my, uh, my lottery course is actually quite fascinating to tell you the truth. Um, Michael Bryden says, did you read Dual Momentum Investing by Antonacci? No, but it sounds very interesting. And John Webster says, any time for the beer. And John, if you come through Puerto Rico, look me up. I'll definitely, we'll be drinking Presidentes. Now, look, it's not going to be anything like a bitters, but um, because it's uh, it's off the island of Dominican Republic. But and, and and I will be, but we'll do we'll see what we can to bring our our quality of beer up for you. <laughs> John says I'm cool. 
Um, Mark Edwards says, walk us through a trade setup like a leap. Let me do one thing because um, we're going to be coming up to the end of this. And I want to show you the most important concept that I can teach you that nobody teaches. And that is, is that I, there used to be this thing called chart books that uh, W.J. O'Neill would create. And you could sit there and they'd mail you the main charts for the Amex and NASDAQ. Not all of them, just a subsection of them. And um, so I've been doing a lot of uh, studying as to why some people make a lot of money in the markets and others don't. And one thing I've noticed that the old guys really were good at spotting patterns. So then I started thinking about my friends who are x-ray radiologists or doctors, and they can see things in those x-ray charts I can't see because they've just been training their, their quote unquote eye for years. Well, it's not really the eye that gets trained. It's the retinal cortex that gets trained. And we use the retinal cortex as hunters, my uh, father was not just Swedish, but he was also Apache Indian. And so my brother was a hunter. I don't like killing animals, but um, the, the retinal cortex is used out in the, in the forest. It's used in combat to spot enemies. But we can use the retinal cortex to spot patterns in the market. And so I had a group of programmers create this tool for me, for myself. Yes, you heard that right. I actually got a group of programmers to create this for me. And um, I sit here and there's, 2,995 stocks in here. And every three months I go through and I look at the center. I don't, I can't tell what stock I'm looking at right now. And I just do this. And I sit there, you know, with a cup of tea. It takes me about, uh, about five hours. Sometimes I'll do it for a couple of days. When Trump won and the market went wacky and we had, um, you know, because, you know, the thing is, the, the Republicans, the sitting Republican president is bad for the stock market. Sitting Democrat president is good. I was not pro Hillary, but um, um, I wasn't super anti Trump either. I wasn't really pro Trump either. I'm real libertarian. But um, when he won, that stock market started to tank. So that next day, the first thing I did was I went through my chart miner. I did an entire scan and chart miner today. I'd never done that. And the reason I did it was because I wanted to know all those charts up to that point. Now you might say, hey, Doc Brown, you crazy nutbag, you can't remember 2,995 charts and I beg to defer. And the reason for that is, go fair, is that's from Caddyshack, by the way. The reason for that is, is that we have studies from psychology that show that even people deep into dementia that can still remember every single face in their high school yearbook. So when they tested facial recognition, they basically blew out at something like 10 or 15,000 people. Van Tharp's a friend of mine who's a psychologist, and we've had discussions over this. So when I do this every three months, and it's just is click, 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 most boring thing on the planet, I'm not trying to think. Let me repeat. I'm trying to do nothing like Zen Buddhism, like sitting here like Buddha, thinking of nothingness and staring in the middle of the meaningless chart but it's not meaningless because my visual cortex is processing at speeds that computers can't even obtain today. And when I do this every three months, my brain, I call it being, is wet wired, is actually wet wired to know of what a subsection of the 15,000 stocks in the market, 2,995 of the most important on the NYSE, the Amex and the NASDAQ are doing. This is exactly how I found Facebook back uh, an eternity ago. When was it that I found Facebook? We look at the monthly chart. And um, back here was when I was in Facebook. So I've been in Facebook since 2013. How did I find it? I found it because when I was going through my chart miner scan, I didn't know what stock I was looking at. My finger froze. What's a weird thing is that your, your hand will actually stop you. Some of you who are military people or radiologists will know what I mean that your unconscious mind can actually stop your, can actually interact with your conscious mind, stop your finger, for instance, from moving. And that's exactly what, what happened here. And what happened was I was flipping through all these chart miner stocks and I saw this just totally whack, whack dabber pattern right here. So they, so you, are, you, are you sure they enacted Article 50? Thanks for reminding me the right name of that. You can tell I feel so horrible about being wrong. You gotta be willing to be wrong to be a good stock investor and option trader. This is what I saw when, um, and it might've been further back. I think it might've been, I think it was there. Yeah, 
Yeah, this is what happened. So my first test purchase of Facebook ever was because I was flipping through Chartminer and I don't like Facebook. In fact, I always tell people, I've only got two rules in the stock market. Rule one is all stocks are bad. Rule two is refer to rule one. And so I'm a, I'm a professional stock hater is what I tell people because you don't want to fall in love in stocks in this business. Okay, so I've made a test purchase on this thing and as usual, because look, it's momentum, it's going into new highs. We know the highest returns are in with the momentum. And as usual, what happened? Blammo, down, down, down. I'm, I'm hating life, right? I'm not hating life, but I'm like, oh, Facebook, is this thing actually gonna do anything for me? Boom, up, up, up. And then it just started screaming, right? And so as it starts moving up like this, that's when I start scaling on my positions. But you know, like, I did this presentation like a couple of weeks ago and I got some guy on a call that made a comment that really got under my skin. He said, oh, just buy Facebook. And I'm like, no, not just buy Facebook. Could you have bought Facebook back in 2013 and looking at that pattern, at that pattern? And then would you still be in Facebook like I am now from a profitable campaign? Now, the reality is, is that when we hop to a monthly chart, and expand this thing out completely. You know, you can see that um, the market pull back sometimes. So if you're highly levered in an option position, you, like here, you, you're gonna get whacked really hard here on a hard pullback. And there's almost always gonna be a hard pullback. A lot of times these are measuring responses about halfway through the move. Oh, by the way, I've got a special offer for you. For a full year, I've got a $5,000 trading package. I've got 90% off for 500 bucks. We've been kind of going, and I'm probably gonna pull out the old sheep stick horn thing and pull me off the stage here. So let me get this up just so you can see it. And it's $500, you get a whole bunch of training. The deal is you get a whole bunch of online uh, trainings that you can do non-synchronously non at any time during the week, any time during the day. And then you also get um, you also get um, a weekly webinar meeting with me where I do what I'm doing right now. I just literally go through my stocks that I'm watching, and then I go. Okay, when you click on that, that should show up as 497. So if it's not, get a message to the organizers so we can get it over to land. But this should be discounted at 497. So we'll do we'll double check that link. Um, but I've got a a market meetup meet webinar. And again, like I say, the big offers, this is supposed to be 90% off running at uh, 497 and I don't know why it's not doing it. I had checked it and it was working before. So um, K Thor says until it ends and he capitalized E-N-D-S and the answer is yes. So you gotta keep running with it till it ends. And again, tradementors.com front slash options, tradementors.com front slash options. Let me drop that link in there and then I wanna keep trying to show you charts. I'll keep teaching you guys until they, they throw me off the stage here. Where the heck fire is my, hey. oh, it won't do it. Okay, that's cool. Anyway, just look, tradementors.com, front slash options. Got a special offer for you. And today I'm gonna to double check on that link and make sure that it's giving you 90% off. Do not pay $5,000 for that. That's a normal rate. You get a $500 rate and you get access to me for a full year. And you get to go through all of my MBA option training uh, trainings that are based on the best textbooks in the world used at Harvard and Stanford, just to make sure that all of your option reasoning concepts and math are completely tightened up. And then you get to get up on a call with me every week and actually just chat with me like we're doing right here. That's why I'm, you know, I kind of reasonably comfortable. So um, let's break it down. What I've talked about here, um, darn it. If I can get it to click ahead. So what you're doing, what I'm teaching you to do is to create a campaign where you're gonna be in a stock. If it's gonna be, you know, the next amazon.com. I think Facebook is our next amazon.com. And you know, like these stocks like Amazon and so forth and Google, and Apple, these are stocks that have been rising year after year after year. And so what I'm doing is starting with, uh, with, uh, with low gearing and low risk, I enter with stock first. That was the first purchase on Facebook back in 2013. And then as it strengthens um, on that test purchase, I'm scaling in 
And um, so when you find yourself in a strong rising stock, you've got to scale in fast at, at the beginning in two to four additional scales after a positive test purchase. And then step four, rolling or exiting. And stops are real useful. So like, for instance, when you look at that massive Facebook positions, I have, I have a lot of options. But if, for instance, the options are so expensive that there's $1,200 left over in the account, I'll buy shares of stock and then I'll trail you know, my 5% stops on that stock. And so when those stock stops start to get hit, you know, the, uh, the stop for the option is a lot further back. That's when I'll start peeling my position back and that's worked really well for me. And um, that's my answer, by the way, to uh, I think it was um, uh, Brian uh, regarding how this would perform before 2007. And the answer is, is, oh my God, I just cringe to think of, of pulling everything out of the market when that top started to go over the waterfall. But um, I, I, um, I, like the, I, I am training myself to be able to pull myself out of that, Brian. I don't want to be so arrogant that I would say that I wouldn't get clipped in that. It's just too critical to, uh, uh, I just, like I say, we have to trade. It's like flying a jet. Um, this is how you do it. And um, you spend hours in the jet, you get better at flying it. Here's how I train. I spend many hours throughout the year training my visual cortex to spot special price and volume patterns that have been confirmed in the top acad academic journals in the field of finance. I gathered a special team of programmers to create a special tool that helps me spot the fastest rising stocks in the market. It's called ChartMiner. And um, I've walked you through ChartMiner. And then, like I said, I've got this special offer that is supposed to be, um, you know, 90% uh, off and running at 497. So if you click over there and it's uh, trying to trying to charge you a tuition of 5,000, let us know and we'll fix it. Uh, John Webster says, I know, but it is about more than money for the Brits. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's about exports. It's about imports. Another very strong movement among the Tory party that was in favor of Brexit is the idea of creating a, um, and I, I like this idea, John, is creating a, um, a, uh, a joint unified market um, similar to the Eurozone, but between England, the United States, and Canada. And I like that idea a lot, but I don't see Trump moving in that direction. And Trump was somebody that I thought would be probably quite chummy with um, the Tory party, right? So love your comments on that, because that is the intelligent direction that I see for England is to form a uh, unified market with the United States and Canada. And maybe, if, you know, pull Australia in there would be a good one. And then have, and then like, for instance, Marius Holocan and I could just fly over there just like it were another state. It'd be wonderful. And we'd feel, um, I mean, you guys are our brethren, right? I mean, we had a pretty horrible time in the revolution, but you guys are still our brethren. Our military forces are like brethren. You know, that's one area where we're really tight. We, you know, Yanks do not understand British royalty, but we do understand British military, and that's what holds us together. Stefan Schmidt says the Scots will probably go with England. Do you think? I don't know. I think the Scots are better off with Europe because they've got more financial strength. They have a stronger, I think, uh, if, I, if I remember right, the Scots have a stronger um, financial, the, the financial district of, uh, or industry in Scotland encompasses a larger percentage of their economy. You know, whereas like England has a lot of export products, cars and um, fine machinery and so forth. Um, Tony Mater says, uh, must be time to short laughing out loud bull market for next 10 years. And I know that's how I think too. I'm like, if this bull market goes for the next 10 years, all these idiots out there on the internet that are telling everybody it's time to short are going to be really eating crow. Mark Edwards says, with a $100,000 account, how much would you put on a call option leap trade? I'm not trading leaps, Mark. I started trading leaps and then I decided I was throwing away too much money because of the, the extra six months of time premium. And so that's why I cut it back to a six to six roll. I've got a friend of mine who's a market maker on the Philly in options, on big stocks like Dell and stuff. And he's the one that brought that to my attention. He said, Scott, why are you throwing the extra money away? You know, go from a six to six leap. A $100,000 account is perfect to start with. However, I still recommend that you start really small. So I would buy, I started with just one or two um, um, six month calls. Um, and, you know, um, and, and like I said, if you, if you were going to do it on Facebook, I mean, you're going to spend, um, you know, you're going to spend, uh, 
for you want your delta by the way to be around um, six, 65 to 75 and you're going to spend somewhere around i don't know 18 1800 for a call on facebook you're going to spend a lot less you'll probably spend three or four hundred dollars on fiat chrysler but since fiat chrysler is trading at like eleven dollars or so then um then you you might just be a lot better off to, to be trading shares of stock in fiat chrysler because it's such a low price stock i want to make that clear so sometimes like wd gan always said he would look at fiat chrysler and he'd look at facebook and he would always say you know my inclination is always going to go with something like fiat chrysler says it's so much cheaper and stefan schmidt said we're back to beer did i jump back to beer oh my god i love beer especially when i've got germans and brits on the call because you guys make the best beer okay ireland we got to slip in there for the dark stuff but you guys have really good beer i'm rather fond of bitters and ale although i have to admit that the best of all is the german pilsner um thank you bye uh so we had somebody sign off uh you sound like a character i'd love to have a beer or 10 with i agree brian like i said yeah come through puerto rico look me up um i hope to get over to england one of these days i do want to i'm really serious about um having a beer with john in the pub franklin diaz says i am from the dominican republic laughing out loud ha 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 you guys have the best beer so like whenever i go over there oh i'm back to beer see there i go but don't drink the don't drink the presidente on tap right franklin it's got to be in the glass bottle you know when you get off you get off the in the airport there in the dominican republic and it's all hot and humid and the dominicans are so friendly and the first thing they do is they they take everybody in the bus to some place where you can get a really cold cold presidente beer oh my gosh i do love the dominican republic and it's highly recommended john o'rourke says i read darvis's book it's excellent and i think he didn't have any of the electronic tools we have today i think he looked at the wsg and made trades calling them into a stockbroker he used barons and what he did was he used the volume movers on barons john um i i um i got a course if if any of you guys that do the package one of the trainings is actually the, I, I did it. It took me a year and a half to fully do an academic documentation of, of, of Darvis and what he did and why it worked. And so I've actually got that in there. And, and I actually work step by step how he did it. He used the volume movers. The thing is, is that, um, you know, chart books didn't come out until after into the 60s. And um, so instead of using the volume movers, I just I, I just every three months. I just used my retinal cortex to take and take a look at the price impact across a large number of trades. Stefan uh, Smith says there aren't the same patterns nowadays with HFT. Stefan, I disagree. I completely dif disagree. And Reg says I remember those books. Look, you know, Buzzy Swartz made a lot of money trading the um, the S and P mini, and he starts complaining about HFT and HFT is moving the market around. I completely disagree with the circuit breakers in the market. I'd say, I feel like we're probably a little bit safer right now. I don't know, I mean, knock on wood, but definitely I don't notice any difference in the patterns today um, that I do looking at the charts even back into the 50s. Uh, Luke says, so what are you looking for in the charts? What I'm looking for in the charts, let's go back to chart, uh, chart minor. I'll go through and I can set up my portfolio by picking the charts and I'm looking for stocks that are rising. See all that volume to the right side? and then see the stocks trending up. You wanna see volume to the right side of the, of the chart and trending up, see, right there. Now, you never know, like I say, 50% of these will go bad on you. So don't, this, this is the first stage. This is like one of those gold mining um, sluice boxes, you know, that goes through different stages that pulls the gravel away from the gold. So some of these don't have the, the, the volume pattern. This one does, so Adobe Systems, you see it's got these big punches in volume and then it doesn't tank after these punches in volume. It kind of, it's kind of like a balloon, like this is a puff of hot air and then the balloon rises. That's what you're looking for. Puffs of hot air and the balloon rises. Maybe that's an easy way to make that clear. Puff, three puffs of hot air and the balloon rises, They're right there. See the pattern? Okay. Um, Michael Bryden says, Andronacci momentum system based off of several slopes and also uses price revenues earnings and I also had dividends I ignore dividends um, earnings is not the most important thing I pay attention to price impact is the most so yeah there's certain there's certain ingredients out there that will generate returns 
And um, if you just basically put those ingredients together, it'll work out well. Michael Bryden says you're not using time efficiently if viewing all price charts. You should be using screeners, testing, slope to narrow search. Michael, listen carefully. Are you listening? I hope you're listening. And I hope everybody is listening right now on this call. The last thing I want is a stupid button, a big stupid moronic red button that says click, and I will kick out a list of of opportunities for you. That's exactly what I'm avoiding. This is the most time efficient way to find stocks. Again, because I'm using a part of my mind that doesn't recognize time, that's timeless, that's unconscious, that's not conscious, that's not all tied up and screwed up and glued into this massive, nasty web of snot death, which is the ego which is exactly what the cerebellum is completely locked into, which is exactly what the frontal lobe is completely plugged into. And it's that unconscious part of the mind that's not plugged into that crap around us that's based on time and space. And that's what I'm trying to tap here. It's like, for instance, I had this old karate master and he whacked me across the head because I did something good one day. And I said, thank you. And he said, I wasn't talking to you. And that's what I'm trying to get at is that you guys have to get out of your head, out of the illusion of time and space and penetrate your subconscious. That's what I'm teaching you to do here. That's what this tool is for. I hope that's clear. Um, oh, yes. Article 50 negotiations have begun, but yet they haven't. They haven't um, pulled the trigger, have they? Um, Selvin Pillay says, this is painful. It can be painful, especially when the market goes against me. Ryan Olson says, wouldn't it be nice if all IPOs broke out like FB? Um, you know, again, most don't. We have studies that show, by the way, I wasn't attacking anybody in specific when I was screaming about getting out of your head. And I feel like the old Buddhist monk now who's, who's, whose students are not paying attention. Okay, it's all about getting out of your head. Um, Brian Olson says, leave us some forwarding information. Uh, you're, you're about to get the hook. Oh, my God. Well, like I said, tradementors.com. Um, you don't have to. If you, if, I've got a free offer for you over here. Um, if you just join this thing right here for free, then you can reach out through the Trade Mentors organization, and they'll put you directly in contact with me. No kidding, right through me at my email. Brad says, could you employ a rule to add to stocks with pullbacks? Oh, absolutely. You know, um, Brad, there's a lot of times when I'm doing my scales where I'll get a reaction or a pullback and then I'll get the volume that'll come in and then I'll kind of pull up off of that pullback and that's right where I scale in. There's a, if, you, if you look for price impact on your reactions, a lot of times you'll find a great... Um, you'll find a great, uh, you know, a great entry. Brian says, do you use the dynamic caller strategy? Absolutely not. Um, spreads are a waste of time. If you're going after high returns, don't use spreads. John Webster says, watch out for the French election. If LE Penn wins, the euro is the dung. Yeah, like I said, I agree, John. There's a lot of uh, uncertain footing going on with the eurozone, but over the long haul, it's going to become a very powerful e economic se uh, sector. The question right now with England is whether or not England wants to join economically with Europe or whether they want to join economically with America and Canada. Uh, Reg says, um, yeah, but Canada has our little prime minister. Don't get me started. The only problem that Canada has is Quebec. Yeah, I know. You heard me say that. Brian Olson, politically wise. It's supposed to be a nice place to visit. Um, now I sound like Trump. Brian Olson, maybe pull Puerto Rico in also and help them eliminate all the red. Hey, Brian, there's an independence party in Puerto Rico and they don't have a brain in their head. And I keep telling them, if you guys have wanted to make a smart you know, chess move, talk about joining the European Union. That's actually a smart move. They're a very high educated group. But like I said, America and the United States and Canada at the end of the day are not going to want to throw away their bridge to all these big consumer markets in Latin America. John Webster says, this will be the strongest um, V market in history um, for England, do you mean? Oh, yeah, bull market in history. John, I think you could be right. I think, I think that's what we may be seeing here. And the reason that I think 
that could be happening is because we're seeing an opening of Russia. We've got the most um, we've got the most educated minds have, have opened up, and and that's just pure productivity. Stefan Schmidt says, and I've heard this before, and this is coming from a German person, so we need to listen very seriously to this. The best Pilsner is in, is Czech, and I've heard that is in the Czech Republic. Um, Arnis is over from around that region. Reg says, a buddy of mine owns a microbrewery in North Alberta. We need to go sample. So yeah, I want to take my wife up to North Alberta. I want She, she wants to see Canada real bad because everybody she's met has been so pleasant. Oh, oh, here we go. Here's a beer, I believe. Berchtesgader. That's from Paul Peterson. Ooh, that sounds nice. He <laughs> he, have another beer. <laughs> a little too early in the morning, but boy, you've got my thoughts leaning that way. Uh, Stefan says the trigger is pulled. So they have pulled the trigger on the Eurozone. Um, but the negotiations are just beginning. The Brits are oh sixty billion dollars. Yeah, like I said, <laughs> it's pretty tough. SKI Quebec says, <laughs> says, uh, says Brad. Scott, the VIX is being reverting, says Doug Harrison. Yes, that's absolutely true. But the VIX gives us some very useful information because sometimes the VIX will rise faster then the uh, then the indexes are falling, and that's really use, useful to pay attention because it tells us. Um, oh, Stefan Schmidt says I'm not German; I'm a Yank. Well, high five, Stefan. <laughs> high five. Um, sometimes the VIX will rise faster than the SPX than the uh, S than the spider than than the S and P 500 is falling, and it's real useful. For instance, if I'm watching the VIX, and then I'm watching the S and P 500 E mini futures contract because then I can kind of really, as Stefan says, go, man. Yeah, exactly. But look, at the end of the day, almost all of us in America are German. It's like 60% of the immigration in the United States is German. And so I explained to my British friends that sometimes when there's a disconnect with, between Yanks and Brits, it's, it goes right back to Germany because um, German was a real nasty place. So a lot of people came over back in the day. So Stefan's laughing now. But um, but anyway, the VIX. If that if you're watching the E-mini futures contract and you're watching the VIX, you'll you'll see divergence and convergence with the speed at which the VIX is adjusting to the index. Because remember, technically, it's implied volatility of in the money and out of the money SPX puts and calls. Right? That's what the VIX is. So and it's done that way because it's basically the the implied volatility measures supply and demand of options. So if you're if your VIX is rising, it means that Wall Street money managers are buying more protective puts or loading up on insurance. That means that low levels of VIX aren't telling you anything more than the indexes are in terms of being bullish. Um, TJ Packman says ever day trade options? Absolutely not. There's a really good study by um, Barber and Odin. Odin is the famous professor at Berkeley that showed that investors hold their losers and ride their winners. And Odin and Barber got all of the data on the Taiwanese stock exchange, which has really heavy day trading of stock and stock options. And they showed, um, they showed um, average losses for day traders. Another thing that they showed, it was like a lottery. It was like um, out of the 250,000, I can get you the article, out of the 150,000 traders that they studied, only like, only like 50 were profitable. So it's the worst possible thing you can do is to try to day trade options. You know, that's like, that's like the worst way to go. Now, um, you know, and, and, and we've got studies from Boyer and Vorkink in the Journal of Finance that show this as well. Um, like I said, um, you don't have to buy anything over there at Trade Mentors. It's a free program. Uh, twice a week, I send out a couple of videos showing stocks that are showing positive price impact that could be tradable. Um, you know that I hardly ever actually test any of them because that's just the way I am. So get over there, jump in there. And then if you need me, you can reach out through uh, through the Trade Mentors organization and I'll, I'm here to help you. And Dan, I want to thank you for the call and um, and uh, uh, have a good time listening to AJ talk about, uh, about his option trading strategy, everybody. And I'll catch up with you guys uh, if you end up over at Trade Mentors. Over and out. Thanks, Dan.